Welcome to the uh, HPC Best Practices webinar series, which is brought to you by the IDEAS Productivity Project, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project of the US Department of Energy. This series is a collaboration involve, involving the computing facilities at the Argonne Oak Ridge and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley and uh, um, uh, Ashley Barker from Oak Ridge and I will be the hosts for today's webinar using the PCIP toolkit to achieve your goals, a case study at the HDF group. The webinar will be presented by Elena Pormal. Uh, she is with the HDF group. Reed Milevix, he is with Sandia National Labs. And Elsa Gonziorovsky, uh, who uh, is with the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Elena is one of the founders of the HDF group, a not-for-profit company with the mission to develop and sustain HDF technology and to provide free and open access to data stored in HDF. She serves as the HDF Group Engineering Director, uh, leading HDF5 engineering effort, and she's also a member of the HDF Group Board of Directors. She received her uh, uh, master's in mathematics from Moscow State University, and also uh, she has a master's in theoretical and applied mechanics from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Reed is a computer scientist and senior member of technical staff in the Software Engineering and Research Department of Sandia. His research focuses on software engineering and developing better practices, processes, and tools to improve software development in the scientific domain. He's part of the Productivity and Sustainability Improvement Planning PCIP, team of the IDEAS project. Elsa is an application IO specialist and system software developer at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Her research interests include software for application checkpointing, parallel discrete event simulation, and software engineering practices. She received a PhD in computer science from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Institute in Troy, New York. Uh, we have issued um, uh, more than 70 tickets for this webinar and we'll, uh, all attendees have been muted. Uh, we will be receiving questions through, uh, through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc. I'm gonna paste the, 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 the addresses in the, the Zoom chat um, just after this. And the, the webinar will have breaks so the speaker can respond to the questions that come in. With that, I'll stop my sharing and- uh, Please. I will share screen to get us started. Thank you so much, Osni, and thank you everyone for joining. It's a pleasure to be here. So let me share here. I assume everyone you can see. Sounds good. Sound, it looks good. Yeah. All right. Let me do that. And well, yeah, we'll have time for questions in between our little our little bits here. So mm -hmm. let me give you an outline of what we'll be covering in this webinar today. So I'll start by giving an overview of the Productivity and Sustainability Improvement Planning, or PSIP, uh, a, which is a toolkit for software process improvement. Elsa then will walk you through progress tracking cards, or PTCs, which are the core artifact of the PSIP workflow. And Elena will provide an experience report on how the HDF group was able to apply PSIP to their project. The bottom line up front for this presentation is this. Our team, the piece of team within IDEAS, is actively working on several tools and technologies for software process improvement that your team can start using now to one, realize process improvements with minimal disruption to current development, and two, mitigating technical risk so you can develop software with competence. The focus of this webinar is on a method for software process improvement that the IDEAS team has developed and applied with numerous teams across the ECP. That includes a workflow for software process improvement, activities and artifacts that help teams set, measure, and realize their goals, and online resources and automated tools that facilitate that process. I'll describe the PSIP toolkit and we'll show you how you can apply it to your own project. PSIP, which as I said, stands for Productivity and Sustainability Improvement Planning, is a lightweight workflow. That is a set of practices for software process improvement. It is set up so it can either be used on its own or alongside method methodologies like Kanban or your flavor of Agile, PSIP is implemented through progress tracking cards, which we'll describe. And at a high level, the goal of PSIP and our work with teams is to help them figure out where they can make incremental improvements in how they develop their software and then to realize those improvements. So for those of you who haven't heard of us, uh, these are some teams that we have worked with. As we mentioned at the start, we'll be hearing from Elena at the HDF group who has used PSIP to improve their documentation, adopt coding style standards, and transition their project to GitHub. Meanwhile, folks from the Alpine and Data Visualization Software Project have used PSIP to develop better algorithms for their users. At Oak Ridge, we know that elements of the PSIP toolkit are being used for internal project assessment activities, 
at Sandia National Labs, my institution, we're using PSIP internally to drive things like version control modernization and improving onboarding activities for projects. And then, fi and then finally, we've been exploring the use of PSIP in academic contexts as well. So the Technical University of Darmstadt, for instance, completed a PSIP tutorial with our team, and then they were able to apply PSIP towards adopting continuous integration. So before we dive into what PSIP is, I'd like to start at a high level. Uh, in our experience in facilitating process improvement activities, we found that teams often know where they want to go, but not necessarily how to get there. And getting started on that path is often the major hurdle. We as professionals, you know, we may choose to do things quote unquote inefficiently, right? Because it, that hurdle can seem uncertain and risky and we're busy enough as is. Now what PSIP does is that it provides tools and resources to set, measure, and then realize improvement goals. This will lower costs, it increases, increases certainty, and it makes it easier to transition to a better state of practice. So what we find is that in our experience, there's this large barrier that needs to be overcome in order to get started on improving practices. And this requires articulation work. That is the work that makes work happen. It means coming to terms with what you want to accomplish, what the state of the project is currently, and then deciding on what you want to improve. Now, once you've overcome that barrier, it's fairly straightforward to make a plan, implement it, and then track progress towards completing it. Teams are used to do, doing this in their normal day-to-day -day development activities. We just try to uh, facilitate that effort so it becomes easier to do that for software process improvement. So that then is what PSIP seeks to accomplish. The PSIP framework provides an iterative, incremental, repeatable, and cyclic process for improvement planning. Uh, software teams can work through all these steps that I'm about to go through on their own, um, or they can do, or sometimes with the assistance of a PSIP facilitator within the ECP. So the HDF5 team went through this whole process, all the steps, and I'd just like to break it down for you and set the stage. So the first phase of the workflow is reflection. The teams that we work with are often comprised of world-class scientists and engineers. They are very adept at devising solutions to technical problems. The challenging part uh, they found is often in identifying what truly matters to them, and then how are the software goals aligned with what matters? So when the ideas team facilitates a piece of effort, we work with them to help summarize their current project practices. So we want to know how they deliver value to their users. What drives the evolution of their software? How do they manage that evolution? And are the tools and the techniques and the practices that they use currently sufficient, right? So to that end, uh, the PSIP team has been directing investments into automation and data-driven analysis to deliver value to ECP teams by accelerating this process. So that would include, let's see, our online guide to PSIP and our project tracking card repository on GitHub. It would include Repo Scanner, which is an up and coming uh, software repository data mining tool focused on identifying practices that could aid collaboration. And then the Rate Your Project Online Assessment tool, which is currently available online. And so case in point, I would just like to briefly mention Rate Your Project. So in the past, assessment of team practices to identify improvement goals was a very labor intensive process for both the teams and their facilitators. We would oftentimes have to sit with teams and go through everything in great detail in order to figure out what their real problems are, how we can be most helpful, and to scale our methodology beyond one-to-one -one facilitation, we needed to automate. So what Rate Your Project provides is a guided self-assessment that helps teams examine their software development practices, how they plan, uh, plan things, the reliability of their software, the collaboration practices they apply. And in the long run, we aim for Rate Your Project to be a comprehensive tool. We like to not just support self-assessment, but also the goal planning and integration of piece of artifacts into the projects, right? But the self-assessment is actually quite valuable just on its own. Teams will walk through a questionnaire where they get to look at all the different practices of their project and they determine where they're at and where they wanna be. So we found, we found this has been very helpful for teams. Now, once they've done this, and once they've identified some things that they actually wanna work on, uh, the second phase of the workflow is scoping to figure out where there are barriers to quality and efficiency. So what inhibits you from doing what matters? That's all I had to ask. So in setting goals, we encourage teams to home in on one or two areas where they could improve in the near term. That could be a week, a month, a quarter. And that's when they construct a progress tracking card. Teams can either write one up from scratch, or more commonly, they consult the catalog of cards that we have online uh, to tailor one to their objectives. And then 
The third phase is planning or as we like to say, securing a commitment to action. Where is the team at right now with their goal? Uh, what concrete steps could they take in a, in a set amount of time, a reasonable amount of time uh, to reach that goal? What could they realistically commit to doing? And here, that's where we wanna see specifics. And the final phase is enacting the changes. Teams iterate on the plan and they will periodically revisit their PTCs to assess their progress. If there are any unexpected setbacks or windfalls, uh, then the team can adjust their strategy as needed. Uh, so to recap what we've just covered, uh, we find that teams often need help getting started on the path towards software process improvement, and the productivity and sustainability improvement planning workflow is meant to just do just that, so that we give them the tools and the resources they need to help define and achieve those objectives, and PSIP is implemented by identifying improvements, one, and then executing plans based on progress tracking cards. And before, I'm going to hand over the mic to Elsa, who will describe what the PTCs are as the core artifact of the piece of workflow. But before we do that, I would love to take any questions you may have. No questions yet. I can give folks just a moment and hand it off. I get excited and I talk very fast. So hopefully <laughs> I, I toned it down a little bit uh, so I'm understandable. We don't have any questions yet. Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, if we'd like to move on, if anyone has any in the chat for me, I can handle handle them there as well. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'll move. I'll move ahead. All right. So as Reed mentioned, um, I'm going to be discussing PTCs or progress tracking cards. Um, PTCs are the core artifact of the the PSIP method, and creating these um, can be a little bit tricky. It requires a group effort and you really have to get the right thinking caps on. So I'm gonna go into detail um, of all those steps. Um, it does take a team effort to, to create these. And by team, we mean all members, including management, everyone should have some buy-in to create these cards. So once you have identified a practice you wanna work on, either through Rate Your Project, or maybe you already know what you wanna work on, um, you move into creating a PTC. So here on the slide is uh, what a PTC looks like. It is uh, quite straightforward and is uh, intended to fit on a slide or be really um, easy to understand so that you can see it and reference it uh, quite quickly. So the elements of a PTC include the title, um, what you're working on, the target, uh, what practice you're gonna change and how that's gonna be changed by the end of this card, um, and then an aligning narrative or user story. Um, user stories have the form as a blank. I want to blank, so that blank. This really aligns everyone who's participating in creating the PTC to have a why and a, a persona of who they're targeting uh, when they're making these changes, um, who and why uh, they're making these changes. Uh, the next part, the table here, is the core of the card. Um, we have a score from zero to four or five or six, however many steps you decide to have. And then we have a state of the practice at each score. So each team always starts off with their initial state wherever they're at now, then have some intermediate states as they're building up towards that target. And then the last score is always the desired state of the practice. There's also room on the card for some comments or relevant links or details. So creating a PTC can be quite challenging, although it looks simple, uh, there's a lot involved. Um, picking a title and target, you know, picking what X is might be the easy part, um, but getting everyone to agree on this aligning user story can be a little bit more challenging. You really do need to have a meeting with everyone in the room and, and really discuss what, um, what perspective you're all coming from. So as a developer, I want X so that our project has higher quality or um, better practices of X. Then you can work on creating the core of the card. Score zero is very easy. We are here. Score, the last score is we want where you wanna be. That's very similar to the target. Um, but it's really this middle part that teams struggle with. They have no idea what steps they, they need to take in order to get to this final practice. Um, software engineering, we always hear of these really great practices, but nobody ever says, 
how do we get there? Because from where we're at now, especially with teams like in the ECP that have been that already exist and already have practices in practices in place, you're not starting from scratch. So it will be a process to change what you're doing already um, to getting where you want to be. Again, the team needs to as a whole, agree that X is important and pick out X to work to create a PTC as a whole. There may be many things you wanna change, but if not everyone on your team agrees that that's important, then things aren't going to change. Also, it's always important to say why is X important and who will this impact? Developers, users, managers, take that user, that persona and create a user story is really important to make sure everyone has the same headspace. And again, the middle part of the card, how do you have those steps um, to get there? That's always the tricky part. And that's where we have some advice. So what makes some good steps along the way? First, think of collaborative and team-oriented things. So can we have a meeting or create a document or uh, come to some agreement about some policy in order to get to our new state of practice? Can we have something that's measurable and specific, create some artifact, create a survey or gather results of a survey or just document where we think we're, we are now or document who our stakeholders are so that we can go give them a survey. Um, something that you can point to is really important so that the team as a whole can agree, yes, we've achieved this step because we can, we have this artifact, we can point to it and we know it's complete. Finally, be realistic and work in increments. Um, thinking, if you think that the whole card as a whole should take a week, it'll probably take a month or two. If you think each step is a year long process, you probably need to break it down a little bit more. So try to be realistic um, in your efforts and just, Think of maybe weeks, and then don't be surprised if it ends up taking months. So I'm gonna step through an example now for continuous integration. And you'll see here how, uh, as we walk through, how a team might have developed this card. So first, someone on the team says, I really think continuous integration is important. Let's do that as a team. Okay, great. What do we need? What do we mean by continuous integration? Um, so here the target is testing run at appropriate times without human involvement and reports are directed and are direct and concise. So that might not be what everyone else means when they say continuous integration, but the team as a whole has decided that that is the target of this uh, particular effort. Then they get very specific and create this user story. So as a person responsible for software quality and correctness for my project, so not just a developer, but everyone who's involved uh, with creating quality and correct software. I want code that's regularly tested so that regressions are guarded against and new code is tested against itself and other commits the developer might not have had. So again, it, this aligning narrative is for all people who feel responsible for quality and correct code in their project. They really want regular testing so that these regressions are guarded against and they can assure code is tested against all the commits that are um, being added to this project over time. That sounds great. Now let's get into the nuts and bolts here. We know where the team's at already. They already have some regression and unit tests, but they're only run when requested by developer. So only run by hand, maybe run by make test if the developer remembers to run it. So they have some tests in place, but they want to make it, make it automated. That is the goal of this uh, card and this practice. So we don't have to worry about the steps in the middle just yet, but we know at the end of the day, we want code is not integrated. You know, the pull request is not merged if all these automated tests fail. If we have our CI run some tests, if those tests fail, co code is being blocked from being integrated. So that's the guard against regressions here that the team would like. So now as a team, you can sit down and start to brainstorm. What are the steps that need to go in the middle here? Maybe we need to sign up for a tool that can automatically run, create accounts, figure out how those 
accounts reported out. What else do we need? So again, getting the team together to do this brainstorming is really important. So after some brainstorming, here's what we get. So we already have some tests that exist. We figured the next step is tests that are run automatically according to some policy. That'll be really easy to point to. This is very measurable and specific. You know it's working when you see the tests are run automatically. Step two is generating the reports and making sure they're archived somewhere. Again, something easy to point to, maybe there's some URL that's generated at the end that you can go and click on and see how the testing came out. Step three, and they've really broken step two and three down into separate pieces here, is that the archived reports, reports are posted somewhere to appropriate maintainers. So not just that the reports are generated, but somehow those reports make it to the person responsible, the person who created the PR or, or something like that. So it is important to this team that not just the reports exist somewhere in the world, but that the team gets an email or gets something um, showing how their changes or pull request, uh, whether or not it passed the CI. Step four here is the same from the previous slide. Again, code may not be integrated um, if automated tests fail. But in reviewing this card, the team decided to create an extra step here at the end, some uh, bypass mechanism. Someone raised the important point that maybe there's code that we really need to integrate for some reason. Um, so let's create a mechanism and a policy for when we can integrate code, even if the tests don't pass. So it's not just the possibility to uh, merge code if you need to, but also a policy of when that's going to happen. And again, you can point to the policy to say, concrete, we're done with this step because we know this policy exists. All right, so when you're starting to create your card, again, sit down as a team and identify which practices to improve and which practices are important to everyone on the team and that everyone can really have some buy-in with. When you're constructing the PTC, you can uh, select from the catalog that we have or work with a PC facilitator. Reed and I and other members of the ideas team would be happy to help brainstorm um, to build one from scratch. Adapt your card from the for the team, filling in specific technologies and possible deadlines. And again, you can do this over time as you identify in the first step, maybe possible tools or technologies you wanna use, fill those in for the rest of the steps. Um, and this can really be a living and breathing document as you're working towards it. And it's very important to add the, the card to the team's tracking system issues or wherever members are gonna look frequently. Once the card is constructed, again, integrated into GitHub issues or Jira epics, somewhere that everyone knows to look at, to reference, make sure it's reviewed during team meetings and continually assess progress towards each step. And you can even you know, reassess if the steps need to be tweaked a little bit as you start work on each progressive one. Now all plans uh, are, you know, it's hard to follow a plan, but they're at least useful to create the plan. So maybe in our CI example, you know, we know that for step one, we want tests to be running automatically according to some policy. But when you actually sit down to do that, maybe there's a bunch of different steps that you didn't really think of. So perhaps the code base needs to be refactored or reorganized in some way. Maybe some additional scripts need to be developed in order to enable this automated testing. A policy needs to be constructed in order to run the test scripts um, at the appropriate times. In addition, perhaps in parallel, someone else could be surveying capabilities and different CI platforms. They need to create accounts, figure out the YAML or the configuration file and get all those details worked out. And all of this can happen through a whole team effort before we actually move on to the CI platform and get this uh, score of one done. So with that, I'll take any questions before handing it off to Elena. 
And there are some questions here for you, Elsa. Let's see here the order they came in. Yes. Okay, so how a small or big uh, chunk of work can go on one tracking card? I guess what I'm asking is how small do you have to chunk up the work for the PTC to be effective? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and one that um, we frequently hear. It's, we want these cards to be a group effort. So if you're finding that each step is something that can really be done by a single individual, then maybe that's too fine grain. And it's, there's no correct answer here. It's, it can be really hard to figure out, um, you know, software engineers are not always the best at predicting how much effort it is to do something. So that is kind of the, the sweet spot that facilitators can really help with is figuring out what tasks are, are good for a step and can be grouped together in a single step. Um, so thinking of tasks that, are, um, that have some artifact and are, can be measurable and can be a team effort. That's kind of the, the goal that I personally use for each step. I like to think if the whole team worked on a step for a week, it'd be achievable. And of course, we know that a week turns into a month or two before anything actually happens. Um, so that's kind of the rule of thumb I use. And I think the next question is related to what you just said. Okay, so the question mm -hmm. is, full buy-in from the team seems to be required for this to be effective. How can one convince their team to get on board? Can one or two people get it started before engaging the entire team? Do you have any anecdotes that you can share on getting folks to buy in? So the rest of our talk will be from Elena. I'll answer the, the last part there first. Elena is going to talk about um, the THG, getting them on board. And so hopefully that'll be a good enough anecdote. Um, but you can get started and start brainstorming, you know, possible um, things to work on. Try the rate your project tool and see, you know, see where the team scores. But it, it can be important to get other members of the team to to take that self-assessment as well to make sure that everyone agrees um, on what needs to be changed. Because we've found that sometimes teams don't even think they have the same problems. Different members think that different things are problems. Um, so it, it can be really important to get everyone at least on the same page. Um, do you really need buy-in from everyone? Probably not. You definitely need buy-in from management. So management needs to be bringing this, uh, you know, bringing these cards up at every meeting, saying, where are we, you know, prioritizing work in this area to make sure that, um, that, that everyone's given the space and energy to, to do this sort of work. Okay, I'll read on, on, on one more question for you and then skip uh, the, the other questions, leave them to the end. So this is the question. What was the main indicator that your project needed process improvements that motivated you to put in the, to put in the time and the effort to adopt the PC toolkit? Um, so I think, of course, every project could use some improvement and there, there's always room for improvement and things to work on. I think the, the nice thing about adopting PSIP and PTCs is that you get everyone on board. So if you're really struggling to kind of have your own grassroots effort and, um, you know, if you can't create change yourself, it might be time to bring out, a, you know, a bigger hammer and a little more formal method to help create that change. And that's where PSIP and PTCs can help. Okay, also I see there are other questions here, but let's just let's go to uh, Elena's uh, uh, presentation. Right, I'll try and, then, and answer the chat as well. Right, and then we'll get back to these um, questions later. Thank you. Thanks. So, hello. Uh, can you can you hear me and can you see my presenter mode? Yes, Elena. Okay, thank you. Then I will start with example of our group, how we used a PC process to, uh, to make improvements in different areas. And for those who uh, doesn't know what HDF stands for, HDF stands for hierarchical data format. And OSNI already introduced our group. I will just mention that we are also developers and maintainers of HDF5, which is a data model, binary file format, and IO library. 
HG5 has been adopted across multiple industries and became the de facto standard in the scientific and research community. And there are many applications that have critical dependency on HD5, including uh, ECP applications. And uh, HD5 is widely used by HPC applications. So it is, uh, we realize our importance of improving our processes development processes because the product we deliver many people depend on. So last year, uh, Livermore uh, National Lab uh, had a contract with us to study the effectiveness of a PSIP in helping our team to improve HDF software development processes. Uh, we assembled uh, a group of five people that included uh, three developers, help desk person and a manager. Uh, who completed PCIP tutorials. So we went through uh, PCIP training. And this group was a driving force behind PCIP project and was responsible for creating project tracking cards based on the input from the team. The group worked with the whole HDF uh, team and identified 13 areas of improvements. And those areas were presented to our LNL sponsors and we worked with them on prioritization. Uh, at the end, we identified and agreed on, on improvements areas that would make it easy for our community members to contribute to open source HDF5 software. So those three areas of improvements were adopting a workflow for updating HD5 reference manual, migrating to HD5 um, software to GitHub, and adopting coding standards. And using PC, uh, we have only four months to work on this project and make progress in uh, all those three areas. And we, we, man we managed to do it on all fronts. And in particular, that what was amazing to me because I was uh, in charge of this um, adopting coding standards for many years, we couldn't agree on them for more than 20 years. And PCIP helped us to resolve these issues. So on next slides, I will talk about the process we followed or maybe not quite followed um, using coding standards example. And uh, as you know, the process starts with creating a progress tracing, a tracking card. So the title of the card was straightforward. Uh, it was TG coding standards and TG stands for the HDF group. Um, so to create a target um, and user story uh, stories, we had a company-wide discussion, not only HDF developers, uh, because we have some other software we support. Uh, we have company-wide discussion, why did we need coding standard and which problems we wanted to solve. Uh, and we started uh, identifying stakeholders and we nailed down to six types of stakeholders and we came up with six user stories. Our group uh, worked on writing them down and cleaning up. And what it became clear that all stories in general targeted code clarity and minimal effort to achieve compliance with the coding standard. So as a result, we left only two user stories, that, but those two user stories were critical for us and proved very helpful in focusing in achieving our goal of uh, creating coding standards. So that was first kind of guiding thing that helped us to achieve our goal. As you see, the first story reflects requirements from the uh, library maintainer and targets clarity of the code that complies with the standard. As a person responsible for software quality and correctness for the HDF5 library, I want guidance on selecting and implementing coding standards so that we can make our code easy for everyone to read and understand. Clarity is the key, understanding is the key in long-term maintenance of HDF5 software. The second story documents requirements uh, from the code developers. And we were first thinking external, internal, but it really doesn't matter. Um, so it targeted um, uh, really um, the way that standards should be on my way as a developer of creating the code. And the story reads as an HD5 library developer or community contributor. I want support so that I'm complying with the standards with minimal additional effort or ambiguity. Once again, it was a critical part that guided us through our discussions. 
And then we spent some time uh, thinking about our target and ended up that what we really want is we want have some process in place to steady convert the code base over um, an agreed upon standard. So there were two things in this. We want to have a standard, but we also wanted to have a process to convert the code. And uh, the next step when we had user stories and target, the first part of our uh, progress tracking card, we had to think about different stages, where we are, what is our goal, where we want to be and intermediate stage. And this is where we kind of puzzled, okay, score zero. What is our current state? We in the code had several different coding styles uh, written, uh, used by different people, main uh, senior developers, and those coding styles existed in different parts of HDF5 software library. In the past discussions, let's have coding style boiled down to why this coding style is better than that one, and we could never agree. So it was much easier to assume that we don't have any coding standard in place, and we were starting from scratch. So we agreed on this. We came to this process with open mind. We were looking for something new, but not throwing away what we have. So our target, we remember our target was steadily convert the code base over to an agreed upon standard. We thought, when we thought thinking how we can achieve this, we thought about ideal situation and we had our second user story. It would be really great that we don't care about code standard. It's done for us. Um, and we need to have a tool that will minimize our effort in converting the code and ensuring compliance. So we came up with a, our final end goal. We sh should have tool support has been put in place to help ensure compliance and running the tool is made part of the contribution process. If we have it, we don't worry about coding standard at all. The next three steps came up naturally and they came up through our discussions. So score three was the team has developed and put in place a refactoring plan to bring pre-existing code in compliance with the standard. Uh, and as you see, we kind of like, we were pushing our final goal to have standard in place we didn't start with it. We still were thinking about our ideal things that we'll do in the future when we have standard in place. So the second one was we thought about, well, when we write new code, uh, it should comply to the standard, but also we probably should use writing new code as exercise to uh, feedback, to assess and revise the standard we have in place. We we'll look at those three, looks good. And then finally, we came to square one. The team has selected and documented and agreed upon standard. And you know, for 20 years, we couldn't do it. So uh, we were not very encouraged by this when we saw this. But we decided, OK, let's try. So let's go from score zero to one. And what will be our next steps? Also, when we look at it, this card, we're like, oh, we really could look at the catalog. It's very close to what we have at catalog. So lesson learned, try a catalog. You will find those cards very, very useful. But what was useful creating this card, everyone on the team agreed where we are, where we want to go, what we want to achieve. And in principle, which stages we have to reach, like code converted, new code is compliant. So everyone was on the same page. So we start thinking about the task needed to come from score zero to score one. And we didn't come uh, with the tasks right away. But we started with the obvious one. Let's look at the standards other project use. Uh, what kind of tools are available? And we looked at a few tools and decided to expand, experiment with the C-Lang format tool. The tool uses YAML configuration files to support different coding styles that were very close to what we were using, but not quite. And some of our develop developers also use that tool on different projects when working with our collaborators. 
So a person was assigned to investigate the tool and developers were asked to provide examples of the source files that used individual coding styles, what was dear to their heart. And a developer ran the tool and presented uh, the first findings to developers. So the next steps, step was to review uh, and discuss the results and rerun uh, the tool on the files with modified YAML file. And these steps were done, uh, we had several iterations of this. And after we had several iterations, uh, we came keeping in mind that what we valued was the clarity of reformatted code. Um, we agreed on a uh, configuration of the YAML file that we documented and the YAML file was checked into GitHub. And now it is used automatically for reformatting a new code and the old code. Uh, also, what we figured out while we were doing all this exercise that one of the problems why we couldn't come to agreement before, we cared not only about C coding style, we also cared about other two things. And it was best practices in what we called HD5 things. So we cared about what is HD5 best practice? You have to be, uh, first of all, it's open source. You have to follow code of conduct. You have to follow licenses. You cannot uh, include any proprietary code. It should be portable. And there are ways how you create HD5 features and how you do development of third party. So how you do development so we are not hurting third party software that is built on top of HD5. And there were also HD5 conventions uh, that uh, like data structures, error reporting, naming conventions, and so on. So we had to come up not only with a published coding style uh, guide, but we published best practices document and we published uh, HD5 so-called things document. And those documents, it's clear, they can be enhanced further and PTC cards will help us to rock as PTC card help us to rock on reference manual for HDF5. So finally, the team has selected and documented and agreed upon standard. And that was great. That was a great achievement. We did it in four months, something that we couldn't do in 25 years. So few words about lessons learned. Um, in the past, our group, we went through CMMI training and CMMI stands for capability maturity model integration, which is a process and behavioral model that helps organizations with the process improvements. And CMI, CMMI it's a great thing, but it's, it's implementation improvements requires dedicated person or team and may become very expensive. We also found that it was extremely hard to get team support to follow CMMI improvement process. We found uh, PCIP is much easier to use and had successfully engaged the whole team. And the team agreed on the target and what was important and what was not. And that helped us to move uh, through the process. We agreed on different stages we need to achieve also. And that's again, it helped us to move through the process. Uh, so this is a great tool to bring team together. Also, PTC, you should be prepared that uh, PTC may and probably will change as the team's work progresses. New ideas emerge and new things are learned in the process. While we all wanted to reach stages two and three, uh, it was like new code written is compliant, code is, con we have planned how to convert the whole code and code, um, we're moving along with this. We realized that code conversion and standard enforcement would be, would be very expensive if we uh, do it manually. So from the very beginning, and it will be hard to enforce, of course. So from the very beginning, having this, that we need automate, we need tool, um, uh, it help us to reach stages two, three, and four by investing time in automation and some code cleanup. After we agreed on C-Lang format tool, while the work was going on on YAML file, 
we simultaneously started working setting up automated code reformatting when uh, PR is uh, was committed into Reaper, and we identified a small portion of HDF5 code that caused problems, fixed it, and committed, and it was only once. And we were able to compromise because we had user stories in mind that emphasize clarity of the code of a specific style. So focusing on the end goal helped us tremendously too. And we learned the value of PTC when we worked on, as I mentioned, other projects like HD5 reference manual documentation. Um, so we created our initial best practices and HD5 things docs, and they, as I mentioned, will definitely benefit through PTC approach. So just to summarize, um, our team did like a PCIP approach. Um, we keep using it in our sustaining engineering effort, and we highly recommend this approach. And you can always find time for small improvements. So thank you. Hi, Elena. Thank you. I have a question here for you then, since you just... <laughs> okay. All right. So. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's one, a question from one of the participants. So how many times did your PTCs change? What did you do with previous versions of your PTCs? Uh, let me go back to our PTC. Essentially, um, oh, here it is. Essentially, we didn't change it at all. Um, we what uh, what we did we really if you look at this PTC it's slightly different what what Elsa was talking about uh, because uh, for example this uh, stage as uh, stage uh, two it is not something we can easily measure so we kind of diverted ourselves from recommendations but what we really wanted we wanted to address all points that we put here. And that's why we didn't change it. What we did change, it was our uh, steps here. Uh, it is the final schema that I kind of showing here, but we tried different uh, things before we realized that this is probably the best path for us to proceed from score zero and one. And this one did change. If I answer your question. Yeah, I think, yes, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Now I have a question for Reed here. So Reed, you mentioned that PCIP can be used, you mentioned that PCIP can be used with processes like Agile, Kanban, yeah, yeah. et cetera. What software improvement method is PCIP most like uh, and what makes it lightweight? Okay. Yes, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to answer that. Uh, let me just like real, real quick, just give you uh, a bird's eye view of where this is all coming from. So there has been a long and rich history when it comes to software process improvement. Uh, much of the early software and process improvement work uh, really kind of got its start in the 1980s as a response to um, you know the software crisis, and there was a need to differentiate software teams who are really good at their work from those that were not in order to, you know, to distinguish themselves from competitors. And what you had were really heavyweight standards that uh, would exhaustively say, okay, you do this, do this, do this, do this. And then it would have a certification process that would then say, well, our team meets these standards and you know, we are up to, you know, we, we are good with our software processes. And what happened in say around the 2000s and 2010s and where PSIP kind of slots in is really in the second wave of SPI uh, methodologies, where you have a lot of influence from agile thinking and like it, and iterative strategies for software process improvement. And that's where I think where we see a lot of overlap with uh, ways of working that you may already be familiar with, like with Kanban and Agile, because that's uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of really strong influence there. Um, so that's what I would say it's most like, and it's lightweight by comparison because we found that what's most important is to work with the team to figure out what it is that they want to work on rather than trying to prescribe a solution. It ends up being very tailored to the team. It is not meant for comparison to others. We're not attempting to uh, rank or, or measure teams in that way, right? Um, and that does set, I think that actually sets it apart from uh, other flavors of SPI methods that are out there. Not to say that I'm, there's a lot of good work out there. Like here, there's one, uh, here's CMMI, second edition right here. I've got it, you know, uh, the Bible right here, nice and heavy. 
Uh, but much of our work is, uh, there are some points of departure, as I mentioned, between ours and ours and other methods. Okay, thank you, Reed. There is another question here. If using something like Git, would you suggest the PTC be one issue uh, and then other issues be used for tasks for each step? I think we, um, that one, I think we may have answered in the chat. Unless Elsa, you wanted to add something. I think yeah, we, uh, I can, I can yeah. address that. Um, it, it depends on your team's workflow. And again, it's, these PTCs are meant to be adaptable by whatever uh, is most uh, useful to you. Um, I think having the whole PTC be one issue and then each step maybe be a checklist within that issue uh, would be really useful. Um, but it is, you know, depending on the, the chunk of work, it might be easier if everyone, if each step becomes an, its own issue and then you can coordinate over there. Um, it just depends on how your team is using issues, um, uh, whether there are you know, intense discussions are happening in the issue, or if you're only looking at the issues during your team meeting and maybe discussions are happening face-to-face -face or over email or Zoom. It just depends on um, where your team is looking and how you, need, uh, how you need this to fit into what's already going on. Okay, thank you, Alza. I see that the other questions in the, in the uh, Google Doc have uh, already been answered. Uh, uh, we'll ask the speakers to go through the questions and uh, mm -hmm. do some cleaning later. Sure. So now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute everybody. So for the participants to uh, give the participants a chance to, if they like to ask questions directly to, uh, to the presenters. So then the microphone is open now. Please, folks, go ahead and, <laughs> and you can ask the participants any questions you'd like directly. Just unmute uh, yourselves. Any questions from the uh, participants? While people think, I have already uh, put in the chat the announcement for the next webinar in the series. It's going to be on July the 4th, mining development data to understand uh, to understand and improve software engineering processes in HPC projects. Uh, the webinar will be by Boyana Norris. Boyana is with the University of Oregon, and we uh, already have the uh, webinar announced in the ECP website for people to register. So, Ozzy, two things. One, I would encourage everyone to attend uh, Boyana's talk. She's very, very talented and passionate when it comes to that uh, that kind of work, and I think it'll make for a great presentation. The second is, I'm getting something in the chat here. You are not allowing participants to unmute. We cannot speak. Uh, well, let's see here. I thought I had already allowed participants to unmute themselves. That's what I have here. Uh, so, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. Let's try again. I think participants. Now, now it seems to be working. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. So then, participants. Now I think it's 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 working. It was my fault. So please go ahead and uh, unmute if you'd like to ask questions to the uh, participants. Oh, there is one here actually. Uh, let me read for you. It is an, in, in, uh, to sent directly to me here. What is the most rewarding part of work with teams on PCIP? Elsa, if you'd like to start. Sure, maybe I'll pick that one. Um, I find it really rewarding when um, we show teams uh, kind of this methodology and immediately they take it and run. You know, we're all um, software developers and people in the computer science really like to get down to the nitty gritty details really quickly. So it's really important to go through this process and take some time and do some higher level planning, thinking about the series of steps before you get into uh, you know, which CI platform is right or which tool we want to use because computer scientists love, you know, I love tools and getting down into those sort of details, but 
it, it's really important to take a step back and try to think about the larger picture first. And then once you have this kind of framework in place, once you've constructed this PTC, uh, take it and run with it. And that's, it's really great to see. Yeah. I also want to chime in that I really, um, I really enjoy working with teams as a piece of facilitator. So much of my work in the past has really been in building tools, right? Uh, designing optimizations with compilers or, 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 or building tools to do instrumentation of source code or, or other kinds of analysis or formal correctness, right? Uh, you know, proving certain properties about programs. But what I realized, you know, in, my, in working with teams is that I can have the perfect tool, but it doesn't matter if no one uses it. And to build things people are gonna use, you have to understand them, right? And by working closely with teams and in concert with teams and understanding what their real needs are, Right and formulating plans that are actually going to work in the real world, uh, it, it's it's so tremendously valuable, and it's also informative for me as a researcher to better understand the needs of the community. You know, by speaking to people firsthand, right, and working with them. Well, just a correction to, to what I said a, f a few minutes ago. I said the next webinar will be on July the fourth. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not going to happen on the fourth, right? So that's going to be on July the seventh. Mm -hmm. uh wednesday yeah. so there is a question here from actually jim uh wouldn't bring here that i think i missed in the beginning so do you think that part of what helped get the coding standards pinned down after not doing so for 20 plus years was the dedicated funding whereas previously the activity was not directly funded and not seen as urgent of course, uh, it helped a little bit. It was my whip. So LNL will be upset if we don't make the progress. But really, it was not the, uh, the major thing. Because uh, what, what we struggle in the past, it's really to understand what coding standard mean, uh, what, what does it mean to us, and uh, to have a kind of open mind that uh, we agreed to come uh, in, into the process. And also it was um, uh, for 20 years, we were stuck on one way of thinking. And this uh, a, a P, a PTC card gave us, okay, let's not agonize on what we can resolve. Let's follow the process and let's see what will happen. Let's exchange ideas. Once again, keeping three things in mind, it's our, it was our target and our uh, kind of values that we identified, values that we were uh, willing to, comprom to find compromises for. It was clarity and that standard is not on our way. And that what, what really helped us. So it's really the first part of PTC card that helped us to move on. But funding of course helps uh, have dedicated team that pushes this process. So, um, by the way, Osni, uh, I have a, a slide to close us out if we have in the final minute or so. Go like. ahead. Yes, we have a few minutes. Sure. Yeah. yeah, just to close out, I want to thank everyone uh, for coming. So just to review what we have covered here today. So we presented on PSIP, which is a workflow that allows you to realize process improvement with minimal disruption to current development. And by now, we hope that you should understand that what PSIP is as a practice or a set of practices that can help your team mitigate technical risk and develop software with confidence to do more groundbreaking work, right? Uh, how to identify topics for improvement by rating your project and using the tools and the resources that we provide, uh, what progress tracking cards are, how to construct them, what are their important features, other online resources that we have, such as the PTC catalog and the practice guide, which are meant to help support you know, developing process improvement activities and how to integrate these artifacts into your projects. And so uh, thank, I just want to thank everyone once again for attending. It has been an absolute pleasure. And if you have any questions for us at any point, you can always uh, feel free to reach out to any of us on the team. Thank you, Reed. So I'll just um, uh, share my screen here uh, mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, again, so uh, thank you for participating in today's uh, uh, webinar. So we'd like to, we try always to improve this series, give us feedback. That's the HPC BP, Bitly, the HPC BP survey 210609, the, today's date. His slides and recording will be available under the, uh, the events website. 
And as I mentioned before, uh, the next webinar, actually, this is not July the 4th, <laughs> I need to fix July the 7th, 2021 uh, HPC series, uh, continuation of the series, mining development data to understand and improve software engineering processes in HPC projects by Boyana Norris from the University of Oregon. And with that, uh, thank you all for, again, for joining us today. Thank you, the uh, speakers, Reed, Elsa, and uh, Elena. Of course, pleasure, always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Asni. Thanks, everyone. Great job. Have a good day.